Good morning. Uh, my name is Michael Fix, and I'm the uh, president of the Migration Policy Institute. And I really want to welcome you to our webinar this morning, the county level view of unauthorized immigrants and implications for executive action implementation. We have three terrific speakers this morning. We'll start with uh, our own Dr. Randy Capps, who's Director of Research here for U.S. Programs at the Migration Policy Institute. Randy's a demographer. We'll then hear from Charles Kamasaki. Charles is an MPI resident fellow, we're pleased to say, and he's a senior cabinet advisor for the National Council of La Raza. He's been deeply engaged in implementing legalization programs starting with the 1986 Immigration Act, and I have to jealously say he is now writing what is likely to prove to be the definitive book on the 1986 Act. Our third speaker will be Jean Atkinson. Jean's the um, executive director of the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, her clinic, certainly one of, if not the largest, legal service providers to immigrants in the nation, and a central player in the implementation of the deferred action programs announced by the president on November 20th. Uh, in brief, Randy will be presenting some of the top line findings and their implications of our release today profiles of the unauthorized populations across counties in the United States. Charles will set the program in historical context and discuss some of the challenges and opportunities in preparing for implementation. And then Jean will tell us about what the service sector in general and clinic in particular are doing. A housekeeping note. Uh, the unauthorized immigrant population profiles from today's webinar, along with the profiles for 47 states, are available on our website, bit.ly, unauth data. I want to remind everyone that the audio and PowerPoint from the net webinar will be on our website later today, migrationpolicy.org backslash events. If you have technical problems, please email events at migrationpolicy.org or call 202-266-1929. Uh, the best browsers to access the webinar are Google Chrome or Firefox. If you have problems hearing via the web, please dial in using the call information sent to you via email. And then we will have a question and answer at the end of the call. There won't be a voice Q&A. But feel free to type any questions into the Q&A or chat box on the right side of your screen or email to events at migrationpolicy.org. If I could just take a second and put the session in a bit of context, as everyone on this call knows, the President's Deferred Action Programs could well represent the biggest legalization program in history with a potential reach to a population almost twice the size of the one legalizing under the 1986 Immigration Reform and Control Act. But as uh, we know, unlike IRCA, deferred action is temporary. It comes with no special funding as IRCA did. It arrives in a, to say the least, contested environment. And as you'll hear, it will affect a more dispersed population than the immigrant population in 1986, dispersed not just across states, but within metropolitan areas, all raising tough implementation questions. Now, before we begin, I just want to emphasize that MPI's work on deferred action and our county-level estimates of the unauthorized lie at the intersection of a decade-long worth, worth, worth of work here at MPI, starting with our estimates of eligibility on the DREAM Act, our work on executive action, our ongoing work on DACA's implementation, and of course, our sleek, new, redesigned data hub and website. So with that, let me turn the floor over to Randy Capps, and we'll begin. Thank you, Michael, very much. Um, and good morning, and thank you to everyone on the call for attending today. I'd like to start by acknowledging some colleagues who helped to produce this data, including Jana Batalova and Mark Rosenblum here at MPI, as well as Jim Bachmeyer at Temple University and Jennifer Van Hook at Penn State University. As Michael mentioned, uh, estimates uh, range over 5 million for the number of unauthorized uh, immigrants nationally who will be eligible for the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, and the Deferred Action for Parents, or DAPA. Our own national estimate uh, published this fall is 5.2 million. 
Of those, 1.5 million we believe are eligible for DACA, including 1.2 million under the original 2012 program and 300,000 with the uh, expansions just announced. And an additional 3.7 million are eligible for the parent program or DAPA. Now, the eligible, eligible programs for these, uh, the eligible populations for these programs are highly concentrated, as we'll see in the slides that we're going to see this morning. About 4 million or three quarters live in the 10 states with the largest populations, and 3.5 million or about two thirds live in the 117 counties that we had adequate data to provide estimates for. So if we look at the top 10 states, they are, of course, led by California, which has almost 30 percent of the unauthorized and almost 30 percent of the DACA-eligible population all by itself. Next up are the major immigrant hubs, uh, the states of Texas, New York, Illinois, Florida, and New Jersey, and then some of those that we would call the more rapidly or new growth states, uh, uh, Georgia, North Carolina, Arizona, and Washington, rounding out the top 10. It's worth noting here that there is a regional pattern in the share of the unauthorized population that is eligible for, for these two programs, which is the right-hand column in this table and the other tables I'll show you this morning. The share that's eligible tends to be highest in the western and southwestern states, as you can see here, California, Texas, Arizona, and Washington, and much lower in the east. Um, and I will explain why that is the case in more detail a little bit later on. Now we turn to Southern California, which is the highest concentration nationally. It's uh, almost a fifth of the unauthorized population nationally and almost a fifth of the deferred action eligible population. Los Angeles County alone is almost 10 percent of both of these populations. Uh, Orange County, San Diego, Riverside are also in the top 10 in terms of eligibility and altogether this region, um, as I mentioned, has almost a fifth of the total. Since uh, these California counties uh, have large, uh, predominantly Mexican origin unauthorized populations, uh, they tend to have a relatively high share, 50 percent or more in most cases, who are eligible for deferred action. Now I'd like to turn briefly to Northern California where the picture is somewhat different. These counties are smaller in total size and population for the most part and have lower unauthorized populations, but altogether do have a substantial number of close to 200,000 who are eligible for deferred action programs. Uh, the percentages in general here that are eligible are lower, is a more diverse population and less, less likely to be Mexican and Central American than Southern California. Also worth noting is that the share in San Francisco itself is very, very low, and that's a pattern that repeats for other uh, major uh, cities in some cases. Then we have the other California counties, uh, Central Coast and Central Valley, inland California, if you will. Uh, a lot of agriculture in these counties, very large, uh, long uh, established Mexican origin unauthorized populations, very high eligibility rates, but smaller overall populations than we see in coastal California, so more dispersed. Still, significant numbers of people are eligible in these locations. Uh, now we turn to uh, Texas, which has the second largest eligible population after California. Here we have the Houston and Dallas metropolitan areas. In both of these metropolitan areas, the lion's share of those eligible are located in the major cities, Harris County, which is Houston, which is in fact the second largest population nationally, Dallas, uh, which is the fifth largest population nationally, and then Tarrant is, is Fort Worth. Here as in California in general, the share who are eligible for uh, the program is relatively high, approaching 50 percent in most counties. Other Texas counties of note are those along the border, Hidalgo and Cameron in the lower Rio Grande Valley, El Paso, and then Webb, which is Laredo. Here, uh, as in um, inland California, we have very high shares, among the highest shares nationally, who are eligible for the program. Now uh, we'll turn a little bit further east to Chicago. Uh, Chicago is the third largest hub for the Mexican origin uh, population in the country and the third largest for the unauthorized overall. It's essentially, Cook County is essentially tied with Orange County, California for third or fourth place in terms of the deferred action population. Uh, you also see significant populations in what's known as the collar suburban county surrounding Chicago. And uh, again, because these are predominantly Mexican origin populations, the shares that are eligible for uh, 
DACA or DAPA are generally high in the Chicago area. Now we turn a bit further east to New York City, and here the story is a little bit different. Uh, Queens and uh, Brooklyn are both in the top 10 in terms of the numbers who are eligible, uh, but the share of the population eligible for these programs is lower, um, and uh, very low if you look at Manhattan and only 30%. That's similar to what we saw in San Francisco. Now, New York City is both a high-cost metropolitan area, particularly in Manhattan, and an area with a more diverse population with a lower share of uh, the unauthorized from Mexico and Central America. We also uh, are presenting here today uh, the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, and uh, Washington, D.C. itself, like Manhattan, like San Francisco, is expensive and uh, has a relatively low share of families living there and has a relatively low share of the unauthorized who are eligible for DACA or DAPA. But additionally, Washington, D.C. is a relatively small geographic area, and the bulk of the population that's unauthorized and eligible for these programs resides in the large suburban districts of Montgomery County and Prince George's in Maryland and Fairfax in Virginia. Now, if we turn to the Atlanta metro area, we uh, see a somewhat similar pop, uh, picture to what we saw in Washington, D.C. There are more unauthorized and more eligible people in the suburbs than in the central city, although Atlanta is somewhat larger geographically than Washington, D.C. Uh, but Gwinnett County, which is to the northeast of Atlanta, has the largest population. Here again, as we see across the East Coast, uh, because of the diverse, relative diversity of the population, a lower share are eligible for DACA and DAPA than we saw in uh, Texas, California, or uh, Illinois. So why, uh, where are the highest shares of unauthorized immigrants who are eligible and why? Well, again, it's Texas and California, especially the interior California and Texas border counties. This is driven by the places that have the highest percentages of immigrants with U.S.-born children. And that particular group that's eligible for, for DAPA uh, really drives these patterns and that exact indicator is available on our website on the county profiles. Why is it so high in these areas? Well, there's a strong association with the Mexican origin population, to a lesser degree with the Central American origin population. Uh, these are people who primarily cross the border illegally, um, and they must leave the U.S. and they're barred for a period of years before they can get green cards, even if they have an immediate family member who's a, a, a lawful permanent resident or a citizen. This means it's very hard for them to get legal status before they form families and have children. On the other hand, there are lower shares of unauthorized immigrants eligible uh, primarily on the East Coast, and this is where you have more unauthorized coming from other regions of the world uh, that are not connected to the United States by land, and that includes the Caribbean, South America, uh, Asia, Europe, and Africa. And most of, almost all of these unauthorized immigrants are visa overstayers. That is, they come as a tourist or a student or with a temporary work permit, they overstay that. And they are not under immigration law barred from marrying a U.S. citizen and getting a green card. So many of them do that. And in fact, anecdotally, we have heard in the Asian community that some people did not come forward for DACA because they were waiting to marry a citizen and they felt that that was a better pathway uh, to legal status. The other thing worth mentioning is the very lowest shares, one-third or less, uh, who are eligible for these programs are in the highest cost areas, Manhattan, San Francisco, D.C., Montgomery County, Maryland are examples of this. The high cost of housing drives families with children generally, not just unauthorized immigrants, out of these cities and into the suburbs. So how many people will come forward? All the estimates we've discussed so far are of the eligible population, but the experience with DACA Two years into the program, as of this fall, our best estimate is only about 57% had come forward, and it was only about 50% during the first year. Part of the reason is because our estimates do not account for individuals who are ineligible due to criminal convictions, those who can't uh, provide all the documentation they need to provide, particularly around continuous residence. Uh, these two particular factors are not available in the data that we modeled. Um, but in general, immigrants from Honduras, Mexico, and Peru uh, had the highest application rates, and the highest application rates were in the southwestern states of Arizona, Texas, Colorado, and Nevada, as well as North Carolina and Georgia. Um, so what does this mean in terms of DAPA? Well, if we have an estimate nationally of five and change million 
being eligible for these two programs, we would anticipate within the first year up to maybe two and a half million coming forward, though we don't know whether this pattern will be the same as it was for DACA. So another question that's come up very frequently um, from reporters and others in the community has been what are the likely economic impacts? The main change here beyond deferral from deportation is that beneficiaries gain work permits. Most of the men are already in the labor force, the over 80% uh, labor force participation and employment rate for unauthorized men, but it's a little bit lower for unauthorized women. And so there's a possibility that a small number, um, and some government agencies have estimated a few tens of thousands might enter the labor force. And this would be somewhat of a, an increase in economic, but a, a modest increase in economic activity. The main change is that the unauthorized who get work permits who didn't have them before will uh, get higher wages. And uh, I know that Charles has, has done some of the research on this, but various studies of IRCA suggest that legalization increased uh, wages by the 10 to 15 percent range. The other thing is that there are some uh, unauthorized uh, immigrants who are highly skilled. Uh, in particular, you could think of a doctor or a nurse that can't work in those fields uh, because they don't have the work permit. And we believe that particularly at the high school level, but maybe across the board, some unauthorized immigrants will get jobs that are better matched to their skill levels, increasing their productivity. So these two effects, the wage effect, the productivity effect overall, could increase economic activity. Finally, we believe that beneficiaries, particularly in states where they can now for the first time get driver's licenses and drive and go to a broader range of places without fear of being picked up by the police, that this broader range of transportation and travel might increase their spending in local communities. Um, fiscal impacts uh, also, uh, we didn't quantify these, but also by earning a little bit more, the tax revenues uh, and income taxes in particular paid by the unauthorized might increase. Uh, most people uh, have estimated, most of the researchers that have looked at this have estimated that a large share of the unauthorized already do comply with income taxes, but we believe an additional uh, substantial number will. And by and large, their eligibility for, for federal and state benefits doesn't really change. Most programs like Medicaid and welfare and food stamps, either you have to be a legal immigrant with a green card uh, or uh, they serve everyone, including the unauthorized. There's very few programs where uh, people can gain eligibility just by having a work permit and deferred action status. The, the main exception to this are actually the states of New York and California where there is a, a Medicaid eligibility category for people with deferred action, and there could be a substantial impact on both those states. Um, finally, I just want to talk about the other data elements that are available in the profiles we're releasing today. Uh, beyond DACA and DAPA eligibility, their origins, and of course, uh, Mexicans predominate in almost all the counties, but there are some notable exceptions, including Brazilians in Boston, Colombians in Miami, uh, Guatemalans in Palm Beach, Florida, and, and uh, Salvadorans in Montgomery County, Maryland. This is just a few examples. We have a number of other demographic uh, indicators available. We also um, look at industries of employment, and there's quite a bit of variation nationally here. Hospitality, which we label as arts, entertainment, and recreation, is the top industry in most counties, but construction is the top industry throughout most of the South, including uh, the big states of Florida and Texas. And this, you know, we all know that unauthorized immigrants have participated in the housing building boom uh, over the years in these Sunbelt cities. And manufacturing is, is the top industry in Los Angeles and in a number of Midwest counties, including Chicago and its suburbs. Finally, agriculture is identified for the largest uh, agricultural counties in the country in Inland California and Yakima County, Washington, although we believe there are significant populations uh, where a lot of unauthorized immigrants work in agriculture elsewhere. They're just too small and too dispersed for us to identify. Um, the next steps in our research, we, uh, these are 2012 data we're releasing today. We hope to update to 2013 soon. As we did with DACA, we will continue to track both DACA and DAPA application trends from the administrative data and compare them to our estimates. And we're also starting to launch a survey of people coming forward for application assistance. And with that, I will turn it over to Charles. 
Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Randy. Um, like so many other MPI reports, having uh, these data so early in the process is really an invaluable contribution uh, for those of us trying to plan for implementation. Uh, obviously, having the numbers ahead of time uh, in a much uh, more detailed fashion uh, permits, uh, permits not just nonprofit practitioners, but the government, uh, philanthropic funders, and others to target resources uh, to where they're needed most. You know, one of the central questions that Randy touched on very briefly um, for those of us engaged in planning is, is trying to predict the application rates for administrative relief. Uh, so my remarks today will focus uh, basically on this question of application rates, uh, taking a quick look back at some recent legalization programs, outlining some, for lack of a better term, bureaucratic, bureaucratic factors that might affect participation, and finally, uh, by listing some considerations facing applicants themselves. Uh, some useful benchmarks from previous programs, Randy talked about one of those that is cumulatively for DACA, about 60% of eligibles have applied. Uh, using that same uh, benchmark for IRCA, the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, as best as we can determine, about three quarters of the eligible population applied for that uh, main legalization program. Another important data point um, relates to how many of those applicants needed outside of assistance, outside of assistance, uh, mainly from a lawyer or nonprofit uh, an immigration service provider. Uh, so as best we can tell from IRCA, about half got some help from a lawyer or nonprofit. And of those, uh, about half of those, uh, or 25, 20 to 25 percent of total applicants, received very substantial uh, application assistance. Uh, surveys also show that nearly half of all DACA applicants report receiving some help from a nonprofit. And in looking at um, participation rates and trying to peg participation rates for the future, obviously uh, some of uh, that will depend on the government's ability to stand up an infrastructure, uh, issuing the right kinds of rules, and, and Gene will talk a little bit about that. Um, also, the extent to which the nonprofit structure can effectively expand a capacity, and my sense is that we will need to more than double, probably increase our capacity by two and a half times current capacity to serve this population. Um, and in turn, nonprofit capacity will depend on, to some extent, on philanthropic support. Although I would note um, that much of the uh, support that applicants will receive from nonprofits and lawyers uh, really comes from funds that the immigrants themselves will pay for. Uh, but finally, in many ways, the best way to look at this issue, I think, is through the lens of behavioral economics, as, as it were. We are trying to predict the behavior of five million human beings. Um, and except for the contributions from private philanthropy, it's the immigrants themselves who are financing the program, not just through fees to nonprofits, but through fees to the government, which will largely pay for this program. So in this context, the participation rates will be largely dependent on the extent to which applicants see the program's benefits as outweighing the cost, a value proposition, if you will. And on the cost side, it's not just the cost of the program themselves in dollar terms, it's the opportunity cost, the risk of exposure, the temporary nature of the benefit, and as Randy noted, whether applicants have alternative routes towards achieving legal status. And obviously on the benefit side, the, the value, albeit temporary, of protection from deportation and work authorization. So in trying to look at this, um, broad question of application rates, um, MPI's uh, data tool won't just help with planning, but will help many of us, uh, the government, practitioners, and the public with a way to track progress of implementation in a much more detailed manner than we've uh, ever been able to do before and hopefully will be an important tool uh, as, as we make uh, mid-course corrections that may be needed uh, for implementation. Uh, 
Jean will be talking in uh, a lot more detail about the two issues that I did not cover much, um, both the government's response and the nonprofit sector's response. Jean. Thank you, Charles. Good morning, everyone. The information Randy shared is vital to the planning that NGOs, both national and local, are focused on right now as we decide how to best implement administrative relief. While the numbers of potentially eligible are extremely important, our planning is around the details. For example, a 17-year-old DACA applicant will have a different immigration history, address history, comfort level with technology, English language ability, perhaps, than many of the older applicants eligible for expanded DACA and DAPA. This will impact their ability to file, as well as the time it will take for the agencies to provide services. We can use MPI's profiles to make assumptions about the numbers who will apply, special vulnerabilities, and how deep of a touch we will need to serve. Almost universally, capacity will be stretched. If only 10% of the eligible apply, we will need to serve almost as many people as we did with DACA. And of course, we, ex we expect the numbers to be much, much higher than that. In some instances, there is a capacity need mismatch. For example, many of the refugee resettlement programs around the country have language capacity, numerous languages, but Spanish may not be one of those languages. The NGO community is working very hard to increase capacity around the country, long-term capacity, so that services are available for renewal and for immigration reform when the time comes. Where capacity is not sufficient, which as I said, is just about everywhere, Service providers have, de have decisions to make about where to focus outreach and educational efforts and legal services. An important point to remember is that most of these agencies already have full caseloads, so they're trying to figure out how to add on. Some questions service providers are addressing include, you know, first, should we focus on our current clients? This might mean focusing on who already comes in the door, or it might mean serving particular populations, perhaps from certain countries or who speak certain languages. Or should we branch out to underserved populations, indigenous language speakers, people living in remote communities, et cetera? These populations will be different in different communities, of course. And I just want to say that obviously Spanish speakers, we know, will be the vast, vast majority of eligible individuals, but there is a huge need to provide information to other language speakers as well. Second, should we use new strategies to reach remote populations, such as mobile units? Now, this could be an RV that travels, or more simply, laptops, mobile copiers, and hotspots for serving immigrants in locations where they already frequent. Could we use Skype? If so, are we doing this to provide information or to offer legal services? Third, who can we serve through workshops? Who will need one-on-one -on -one meetings? In the screening process, there will be a need to have mechanisms in place for triaging cases with the least touch to the highest levels of support needed. Randy touched on this earlier, the issue of the importance of screening. There's also been a recent study that showed that 14.3%, and this was a survey of some agencies that serve DACA individuals, that 14.3% of DACA eligible individuals were found to be potentially eligible for another form of relief that would lead to lawful permanent residence. The implication here is that there may be a sizable number of people for whom DACA and DAPA are not the best options. The so screening, it will be huge. And fourth, where can we partner with non-immigration legal service organizations to expand our ability to serve? Partners could include libraries, medical clinics, community colleges, and on and on. What will these partnerships look like? We expect to see significant variation in models. One example of creative collaboration within an agency is Catholic Charities of Monterey, California. Clinic recently helped 10 staff get BIA accreditation, only three of whom practice immigration law. The others, including the tattoo removal program staff and family strengthening staff, will be pulled from their regular jobs during the first couple of weeks of DAPA implementation to conduct some screening, referral, and application support to the immigration staff. That is just one of many, many models that I believe we'll see out there as implementation occurs. As we heard from Charles, we can expect that roughly half of the DACA and DAPA eligible applicants will get some help from an NGO. The other half either won't seek or won't receive help. This raises a number of implementation issues in respect to the people service providers will assist and those we won't. All nonprofits and trusted agencies in the community have to be stewards of high quality community education materials because people will be coming to them for information. This is particularly important for people who don't receive assistance. 
theory, the Committee for Immigration Reform Implementation, which is a collaboration of national organizations that came out of a national legalization planning conference in 2013, has a lot of information that organizations can use. Organizations can find information, which is freely available and adaptable at adminrelief.org. Outreach and education is crucial, both as a way to provide accurate information to the applicants who will self-file and as a way to make the application process more efficient for agencies directly serving applicants. At a minimum, the information should cover eligibility and documentation requirements, and very, very importantly, information about avoiding notario or consumer fraud. Advocacy will be vital to ensuring the problems with the application or decision-making process are addressed quickly so people are not deterred from filing. The NGO community is focused on getting the maximum number of eligible individuals to apply early in the process. Participation will be determined in part by the clarity and generosity of the application process. In light of this, I'd like to end with a few recommendations to our colleagues in government. Uh, we request that information on the application requirements be available as soon as possible so that we can accurately prepare potential applicants. And of course, that the documentation requirements, particularly around proof of residence, be generous. We hope you will put in place a mechanism to ensure that there are speedy approvals, which will encourage others to file. We would like to see confidentiality protections to protect applicants from future enforcement actions and alleviate fear about applying. We believe there should be protections for employers who verify employment for applicants who worked without authorization. We'd also like to see a quick turnaround on decisions on applications for BIA recognition and accreditation so that we can have as many accredited reps on the ground as soon as possible. Finally, I'd like to add that we've been grateful to the administration for meeting with advocates and soliciting our feedback. It's a very exciting time for those of us who've been advocating for immigration relief for unauthorized immigrants. It's important that we get it right, and the information we've learned about today will help us do that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jean. Um, those are excellent presentations. Thank you all. Uh, let me just start with the uh, simplest of questions, which is, uh, uh, Charles, could you um, simply repeat your numbers on the, on the approval rates for DACA? Uh, well, uh, what I was referencing were application rates, so for... Uh, no, excuse me, to repeat the share of DACA's who received help. Um, well, there have been a couple of surveys. Uh, one suggests that about 45%, uh, this was the largest sample Tom Wong survey, uh, suggested that about 45% of DACA applicants report receiving, quote-unquote, some assistance from a nonprofit. There are a couple of other surveys that have smaller samples that suggest higher numbers, even up to 60%. Uh, so I've been using this about half number as was what I think to be the most accurate. Thanks. Um, Randy, I was thinking um, as you went through your presentation, the one thing uh, I, I know it was, it was very pointed and, and targeted, but what might be good is for the benefit of our audience, is to talk a little bit about what's distinctive about the method of estimating that that we've um, developed uh, along with our friends at Penn State University and Temple University. Yeah, there, th thanks, Michael. There, there are a number of different approaches to, to doing this, and you know the key thing is that the American Community Survey data that we use and, and most others use doesn't ask about legal status; they just ask about whether somebody is a citizen or not. And what we do that's a bit different from others is we link it to another lesser known, smaller federal survey called the Survey of Income and Program Participation, SIPP, or SIP. And the SIP survey data actually do have a variable for legal status because people are asked uh, whether or not they have a green card. So we link these two, and essentially people who have similar characteristics in the two surveys would be coded as unauthorized. Uh, you know, for example, if you had, uh, say, 80% of people reporting Mexican origin uh, and that entered during the 1990s and worked in construction, and 80% the, the of them reported not having a green card in the SIP, then we would estimate that 80% of Mexican immigrants working in construction who entered during the 1990s in the American Community Survey are unauthorized. But that's basically the way uh, the methodology works. now. I should also say related to that, that there will be some differences between our estimates and other estimates, and that uh, this is a, a function of the different methodologies that we employ. 
Okay, great. Okay, Brandy, here's a here's a DACA question. How many school age applicants are now DACA recipients nationally? How many school age, school age applicants, applicants are DACA, DACA recipients? recipients? The question is I, nationally in Pennsylvania. I'm not sure you'll have. Pennsylvania. I don't have those data in front of me. That the the, the U.S. Uh, Citizenship and Immigration Service, USCIS has released some national data on the ages of people who, who are beneficiaries of the program. The data that we have have only been developed for those who are eligible. Um, and I believe that they are up on the USCIS website. I don't think they go below the national level, but I think that that is also a point, and I know that there actually are some USCIS people on the call. Uh, that, they, that they might develop some data similar to this in the future of beneficiaries at the state level because that could be useful to a large number of people in the schools. Do we have any data on the DACA, 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 DAPA um, populations uh, in Wisconsin in particular uh, in our new we, this is a question about the rural areas and whether there's data on yeah, no, we don't. eligible in the rural areas. I don't think we do. Is there any other source that could possibly be turned to? I, do, I don't think so. We haven't developed estimates for rural areas because it's very hard to, uh, the, the population is very dispersed and the, the sample sizes are too small. We do have a Wisconsin state profile uh, that has a state number in it, and I think a sort of back of the envelope way to do would be to look at the share of Mexican and Central American immigrants that reside in more rural areas using the American uh, the Fact Finder, which is the Census Bureau's web page, and you could use that as a rough way to approximate what share of the DACA and DAPA population might be in in those areas. Uh, but even that may be difficult because uh, it's hard to identify rural areas sometimes in the Fact Finder as well. Uh, Jean, and then maybe Charles, too. I was thinking myself about employers' centrality in all of this and trying to bring them on board and make, and make them full participants, particularly in documenting people's tenure in, in the United States. <clears throat> what are the lessons from the earlier uh, legalization programs that you would cite to? Is there a toolkit? Is there a set of strategies that work? work best it's I, you've struggled with this for many years I would I'm going to punt it to Charles I would say that the challenges with the Immigration Reform and Control Act it brought in employer sanctions whereas before that had not been an issue so it was I think a different field we were playing in than we are now and we know that we're hearing anecdotally quite a bit that employers are very concerned about writing letters to establish residency I think that's right um, I, I think it would be helpful, and uh, the administration did do um, some statements to the effect that uh, employers would not be targeted specifically for assisting DACA applicants. Uh, having said that, um, we live in a litigious world, and uh, lots of employers are risk averse. Um, so personally, I think with some exceptions, I would not expect employers to be a principal source of documentation for continuous residence for applicants. The couple of exceptions might be in um, situations like, say, agriculture, possibly, you know, general contractors in construction, uh, where uh, it is fairly widely known that there is a fairly large proportion of the workforces that might be unauthorized where employers would not be uh, newly exposing themselves, uh, but where they have established very strong ties with employees and have every interest to, to try and help them get right with the law. Great. Um, uh, Randy, what do we know about um, eligibles who are non-English and non-Spanish speakers uh, how many there are? Do our data lead? Do our data clarify that? Um, their spatial and their their geography as well. We are still in the process of putting together data on the demographic characteristics of people who are eligible for DACA and DAPA, um, including English proficiency, educational attainment, and language that people speak, et cetera. And so we don't have those data available yet. We will be. Uh, compiling them. Um, 
I would say that based on, um, again, the argument that I gave earlier that, that people who are not from Mexico and Central America are more likely to be visa overstayers and therefore less likely to have uh, U.S. Uh, citizen children, less likely to be eligible for the TAPA program in particular, I would expect that the share of non-Spanish speakers in the DACA and DAPA population would be lower than the share of non-Spanish speakers in the overall unauthorized population. That is, you're going to see fewer people from Asia and from Africa, from, from other areas where, where Spanish is not a predominant language. Um, so I think if you look at our profiles and you look at the percentage that speak other languages other than Spanish or English, uh, which is the lion's share almost everywhere, that will be the, the high end, the maximum percent you would see of people who uh, in the DACA DAPA population who speak those other languages. It's probably lower than that. Great, great. Um, quick question, is this the first ever county survey, county level analysis of of the unauthorized population and um, what year are we really talking about? Are we talking about the 2012 census here? Yes, it is. It's the first time that we, we've been able to drill down to this level. And, and I would say, I've been asked before, why hasn't this done before? And the reality is, until the American Community Survey was conducted, we didn't have sufficient data to do something like this except every 10 years. And so the figures quickly become outdated. The American Community Survey has only been fielded for about seven or eight years, and we had to combine five years of data to get these data. So you could see that this, the availability of data is really only a couple, three years old, um, which is why suddenly now so many people are doing uh, state and local level analysis of immigrant populations. Because we had to combine five years of data, it is an average of 2008 to 2012. Um, there are some ways in which we were able to kind of average things such as income, uh, such as the time that somebody entered and other factors up to 2012, uh, but some of some of the averages are based uh, across all five years. Um, Charles, do you know the surveys of the DACA population well enough to know, uh, or was this question asked, what were the educational characteristics of those who came for, who asked for help and those who didn't ask for help? Actually, I think That's Randy's done some of the work in, in that area. Um, this is the who DACA for at one year mark um, kind of report. Yeah, we don't know. There, there, there hasn't been any information released on the educational attainment of people who actually applied for or were approved for DACA, and that is not something, it's my understanding, that the federal government had the capacity to produce. Uh, I think the question re revolves around, in the surveys that Tom Wong and Roberto Gonzalez did of the population that they were able to survey that did come forward, um, not necessarily, we don't know whether they're approved or not, do we know their educational attainment relative to the eligible population? And, and I don't know if anyone's done that analysis. Um, but what I have, what, what I've heard based on the presentations of this data, and again, it's not data that I'm that familiar with, is that it did, it did tend to be relatively well-educated groups. And I think the two big avenues into uh, DACA for application assistance and networking were through um, you know, the, the high schools for people who were still enrolled in high school and people who were in higher education. Um, I think we have reason to believe, and part of this is because the ages, there, there was some information released on the ages and it, it, people tended to be on average a little bit younger in terms of the people who submitted applications than what we saw in the, in the eligible population. So we think a lot of those older people who weren't still in school, who are out in the workforce, didn't come forward. Um, and I think anecdotally, uh, at least, uh, we believe that it was a lot easier to reach people through educational institutions, a lot harder to reach them once they, they were no longer um, enrolled in those institutions. But I don't know as though uh, we or anyone else has done a sophisticated analysis of that. Great. Jean, um, here's a question, and you and Charles might want to jump in on, on this. Shouldn't eligible immigrants for deferred action be advised to simply ask for employment verification without getting into a discussion with the employer about why employment verification is being requested? Is this a policy? Is this is this policy viable? It seems it seems to the to the questioner that this would protect the employer and the applicant as well. 
Yeah, I think that's a, a fine idea. I can't can't see any problem with it because I don't think USCIS will go after an employer of a single employee. I think it's going to be more of a pattern and practice issue of hiring unauthorized people where it would be an issue. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's good. Um, one more idea would be we know that some of the unions are interested in giving um, documentation to prove when people paid their union dues. So if the employment is connected to a union, that may be another option outside of the employer. You know, I had a thought on that, too, which is that it's already true for some unauthorized immigrants that they provide some uh, verification of their wages and potentially employment when they're applying for benefits for their, for their U.S. citizen children. And so for the DAPA population, they may already have assembled some of this in some cases. I don't know whether it would be uh, the same kind of sufficient documentation for these purposes, but they may already have assembled it in some cases. The issue is probably going to be more people who are unauthorized where an employer knows they're unauthorized. Because if you're fully integrated into your employment, you're going to have other documentation of employment, mm -hmm. whether it's evaluations, paychecks, right. things like that. So, right, right, so it right. may not work in this instance, the person suggesting, but it may. Hey, Randy, do we know what share of the of the DACA DACA eligibles might be called highly skilled? This is a, an issue of great interest to to me and. Uh, are they also concentrated in the East Coast and high-cost metro areas? I think by highly skilled, we could say highly educated. Yes, I mean, we don't know the answer to that yet because, again, we have not um, been able to uh, yet assemble information on educational attainment of the DACA and DAPA populations. You know, we, we did look at the DACA populations, and yes, that there, uh, there, were, there were more high-skilled DACA applicants uh, that is those with a, with a, a degree or with some college uh, on the East Coast, particularly the Northeast, um, than there was in further West and South. But the DAPA population will be different. The parent population will be different. In general, it will have a lower skill level. Uh, and so I wouldn't want to predict that that's necessarily going to be uh, the case with that population. Um, that said, the overall diversity of the population does matter somewhat because, in general, even among the unauthorized, those immigrants from Asia, South America, the Caribbean, and Europe tend to be a little bit better educated than the unauthorized uh, from, from Mexico and Central America. And so we might see the same pattern repeat. Okay, so here's the stumper, Randy. Um, in counties like Dallas, about 20% of the uh, po undocumented population arrived less than five years ago. Does this contradict reports that illegal immigration had dropped to zero or was minimal after the financial crisis? What are the possible explanations for this? So Texas is a little bit of an outlier. And it's a bit of an outlier for two reasons. First of all, due to the oil boom in particular, but in general, Texas's economy has, has been outpacing the nation for most of the last five years. And in particular, Dallas, Houston, even more so, Austin and San Antonio have had among the lowest unemployment rates in the country throughout this period. And I think they still might be a percentage point below the national average. So we've seen a massive migration, and, and there was a recent report done by Rice University that was very interesting that the amount of internal migration to Texas actually exceeded international immigration between 2000 and 2012. So all of that tells me that there has been a large influx uh, of everyone, including the unauthorized, but also including immigrants and everybody else. Um, and so I think that's one explanation. Then more specifically, just within uh, the last couple of years, we would see this trend maybe continue somewhat because uh, Texas has been the, is, is where the vast majority of this recent wave of Central American migration is crossing through the lower Rio Grande Valley in South Texas. And Houston is their number one destination uh, for, for instance, for the unaccompanied children from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras who are reunified with their families. Houston is the number one destination, and Dallas is also very high up there. So I do think that uh, Texas in general and Dallas and Houston in particular are a little bit different with a more recent uh, immigrant population generally than a lot of the rest of the country right now. Charles. Uh, just to add one thing, um, it's important to recognize that most of the studies uh, related to reduced or, in some cases, um, 
zero net migration uh, focused on the net. Um, so you're always talking about uh, situations where there are flows back and forth. And so if there was a net out migration of, say, Mexicans from California to Mexico, um, and a net in migration from Mexico to, say, Dallas, um, those would be all fully consistent with each other and fully consistent with the notion that um, the, the points that Randy mentioned as well as the, the fact that net migration from Mexico may well be down. And I would like to actually add one set of data points here. They're not ours, but Bob Warren, a, a well-known demographer, has published some estimates uh, through Center for Migration Studies, CMS, that show a, a very sharp downward trend in the unauthorized population in California and a, and a pretty significant upward trend in the unauthorized population in Texas over the last five years or so. And I think that also supports the general, my general theory that a lot of people are moving to Texas and they're moving out of places like California. Okay, Randy, we have a consumer question here, which is when will the city level data be ready? Well, the city <laughs> level data are a little more difficult and um, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to produce that much at the city level for technical reasons. The, um, these are not, the counties are not identified as such in the American Community Survey data that we could use. They are on the web, but not in the, in the data that we got as a data set um, from, from the IPUM uh, people in Minnesota. Uh, they identify sampling areas, basically. And these sampling areas, sometimes you construct counties, sometimes you can't, and that's part of the reason why we have uh, the 117 that we do. Constructing cities is even more difficult. For some of the very largest cities, it's possible. Uh, for New York City, it's, you know, the five counties we showed. For Chicago, it's most of Cook County. For Houston, it's most of Harris County. For L.A., it's most of L.A. County. But below that level, it is going to be very often often quite difficult to actually go uh, to find the city boundaries in, in, in the Census Bureau data. So we would certainly not be able to do anything this systematic, unfortunately. But for the major cities, we probably could, and at some point, we probably will. Um, Here's, uh, Jean, maybe you and, and Charles could jump in on this. Um, we've talked a little bit about the application processing assist, about application processing assistance uh, as being central to implementation. You guys have been involved. What are the, some of the thinking about overall uh, communication strategies, uh, outreach, use of the media, use of social media? And then I was also thinking myself about, the use of information technology and automation, the kinds of things that are being imported into the naturalization process to some degree and that you guys have been pioneers on. So just a couple questions in there. Um, I, you know, we're looking at a broad range of outreach strategies because we know there are different ways to reach the population. The Latino community is very um, uh, mobile focused and there are a lot of good ways to reach out through social media and other ways. Um, in our, the series, the National Implementation Group, one thing they're looking at is a hotline mm -hmm. to have phone information because we know that some of these older applicants will not be as comfortable with computer technology. But obviously we want to be on, you know, PSAs by radio, by TV, in multiple languages, hotline, internet-based languages, uh, face, you know, Facebook and YouTube everything out there, and we have groups of organizations working on strategy implementation. This crate takes money. Are you finding new funders coming into, into, into this area? Uh, well, that, that in fact... drove a fair amount, number of funders into, into this area, but is it... Well, that, in fact, is the challenge. Um, you know, trying to allocate resources between outreach and, and communications and application assistance, I think, is a real question. I think uh, my guess is that we will be more heavily focused on application assistance at the front end, um, and uh, in part, places where your data tool might be helpful is where we see l lagging application rates, we might implement more targeted strategies. Um, you mentioned, Michael, something that's, I think, very important, and that, and that has to do with the application of technology throughout this process. And so uh, there are members of Siri, the Immigrant uh, Advocates Network, um, and others uh, who are partnering with them that are really focused very much on using new technology tools to assist applicants. 
Uh, the uh, USCIS itself is, uh, seems to be experimenting with uh, application portals and assistance portals uh, on the web. Um, so one thing that we might see that might be an analogy to IRCA, uh, so back in the days of the Immigration Reform and Control Act, um, the legalization program itself helped stimulate a number of innovations for the government. Regional processing centers is, is one that comes to mind. Uh, and we might see the same analogous types of systems changes um, in application processing uh, on the government side that, that this program might help, in effect, move the agency uh, a couple of generations of technology more, through a couple of uh, generations of technology more quickly that over the long term will help the government and the taxpayer and applicants uh, for the processes for other visa petitions or other kinds of um, examinations to become more efficient. Very good. Hey, Randy, I want to ask you uh, to, to talk a little, to say again about what you think the press of business will be that might come from the Section 601 waiver program, which is part of the, yes, which is an important part of the, of the executive order and that it reaches a fair number of people and that will also um, contribute, you know, you know Yes. Keep Jean busy over the next several years. <laughs> yes, yes. So this is this is an I, I may actually have to de 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 defer or at least have Jean back me up on whether or not my explanation of the six and one waivers is is correct and comprehensible. But um, it's a little bit it's a little bit complex. It gets back to this issue that I alluded to earlier that people who cross the border illegally have to leave the United States and then are barred for a while from getting a green card, even if they have. Uh, a, a near relative in the United States that could sponsor them and they would otherwise qualify. Whereas people who come with a valid visa, like a tourist visa or as a student, and then overstay that visa are not barred and under current law and, and, and don't have to leave the country. And so they can apply if somebody, if an immediate family sponsor, sponsors them. So that's how you get such a large population of people that have U.S. citizen children, especially older children over 21, who are still unauthorized, that's how you get a significant population of people who are married to U.S. citizens and still unauthorized. And our estimate of the population that's married to either a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident that's still unauthorized is about one and a half million people nationally. And um, we have uh, some estimates of this population on our profiles. Um, they've had the county level as well as at the state level. It's a, very, it's a small share of the total unauthorized population, just a little over 10%. Um, however, some of those people are also eligible for DACA and DAPA, and some of them are not. And so some of those may actually come forward during thinking they're eligible for DACA or DAPA. The issue is that we don't know and, and, and how many of those people really are going to be eligible, right? Because under this executive action, the Obama administration said, we are going to review this policy. We are going to review what's known as a hardship waiver standard, that, that if, if families claim that severe enough hardship, then they don't actually, that, then they, I guess they can know ahead of time whether or not they're going to be barred and whether they can come back and get a green card without having to wait for several years, right? Is without having issue? to wait outside the country. Without having to wait outside the country. Because somebody who's got a 10-year bar and they don't know whether or not they're actually going to be able to get the green card, if they leave, then they can't come back for 10 years, and that's not going to be very good for their marriage. So they're not going to do it in most cases. And if the administration could provide some clarity and say, hey, actually, you know, you can show this hardship standard in a wide number of cases, then a large number of people might be able to take advantage of it. Is that basically what we're That's thinking? Right. We just don't know what that standard is going to be yet. That's still something, policy that the administration still has to develop. Okay, Randy, quickly, two, two substantive questions about the methods. Um, are there any estimates of the overlap of eligible DACA DAPA populations? Well, we, we have produced those generally, but we haven't done them at the state and local level. So for the purpose of the estimates that you see, the, those who are eligible for both programs are included in DACA in the childhood arrivals. Again, those who are eligible for both programs in our estimates at the state and local level are included in the DACA, the childhood arrivals program. Uh, and we use Pumas, not Super Pumas? Yes, and that's the, the Pumas are those areas that I referred to, the sampling areas that are, I, 
can't rem and never can remember if it's 50 or 100,000 people, but they're the, they're the sampling areas that we use to construct the counties, and when you get up to five years of data, you can usually I identify those areas. The, the, the Census Bureau changed their whole way of constructing these areas after the 2010 census. So um, it's a little bit different in, in each year now, and it's not, I'm not even sure that the Super Puma still exists in, after the 2010 census. Okay, on that super technical but interesting note, um, <laughs> I want to thank the audience. I want to apologize for the many of you who asked questions that we weren't able to get to, but uh, we did as well as we could in the time that we were allotted. Uh, just in closing, let me note the following. For any reporters on the call who have any further questions, please call Michelle Middlestat at 202-266-1910. As a reminder, uh, the slides from today's call are going to be available on our website later at www.migrationpolicy.org. And the unauthorized immigrant population profiles from today's webinar, along with the profiles for 47 states, are available on our website or bit.ly backslash unauth data. So thank you again, and I want to thank our speakers for just doing a phenomenal job, and um, goodbye.